Should animation be realistic? I mean, think about it. Obviously not. It's not real. It's not even a recording of what was once real, like live action. It's not real, so it doesn't need to be realistic. So, if that's the case, when was the last time you remember somebody praising anime for not being realistic? For taking advantage of the unreality of animation to be stylized and unrealistic? Bet it doesn't happen to you a lot, does it? Yeah, maybe a friend of, uh, of yours, one or two. But it's certainly not a common thing praised online, for example. Oh, this show is so weird. You know, people will say how great it is that something is wacky, you know, weird comedy, or that it will have weird themes, Mothman prophecies, or, you know, dealing with psychic Nazis from space or whatever. But not intentionally unrealistic. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Dagger of Kamui has not retained a lot of its respect amongst modern anime fans. Besides being a, a much older film, um, it is not striving to be realistic all the time. Now, it is still trying, um, it, is, it, it is still realistic in a lot of ways in a lot of scenes. But the director, Rintaro, is very willing to be stylized. And I want to talk a bit about stylization in anime, and particularly the Dagger of Kamui. Now, this is a samurai epic, and I mean epic. This is a thing that crosses continents and deals with uh, a large cast of characters, and it's over two hours long, which is really long for an animated movie. So, um, it's remarkable that, despite the fact that, again, a lot of this movie is, you know, guy traveling through forest and very realistic things, how much of this movie is quite stylized. There are quite a few sequences in here where um, the background fades away, where um, it uses very unusual uh, color scheme for a particular um, sequence. And clearly not just to be different, every time it does this, uh, there's a pretty clear reason why it's being done, to heighten drama, to get you more in the mind of a character who is experiencing something very dramatic or traumatic. It makes sense for us to feel that by feeling a difference in the presentation, by feeling things being different. There's this one particular sequence uh, that's all colored in reds and blacks and whites where some characters... Uh, let's just say, ingest a dangerous substance. And it's amazing seeing how this is rendered on screen. Again, remember, this is all being drawn. That's not camera effects there. So it's clear that the staff are being very intentional about this. Because there's so much realism in the more mundane scenes, the stylization is intentional. And you also see that uh, even in the less stylized scenes, in how close the camera is on characters' faces. Now, obviously in animation, the camera isn't literally zooming in and zooming out on characters. It's all pre-planned at the storyboard stage. But a lot of this film is pretty close in on characters' faces, close shots on a lot of people as they're in um, even very action-y sequences. And I think one of the reasons for that is that that's a little disorienting. When we're that close on a character, it's hard for us to tell where everyone else is. Um, if somebody is running around or jumping around, um, when we're that close, we can't tell. And especially for a samurai flick with ninjas and all sorts of those things, um, you don't know how fast someone can react. So by closing in on characters' faces, we get that slight bit of disorientation, but we're also focusing more on those characters' reactions to things. When the camera is pulled way back, it's a little bit less subjective. It's a little bit more of this objective view of reality and what's going on, whereas The Dagger of Kamui is a much more personal story. And that's a remarkable thing for an epic film, a film that does go in <laughs> so many different directions and travels so far around the globe. 
And when I mention that, I should mention the fact that the Dagger of Kamui does feature a lot of different locations, um, which means it features a lot of different cultures. It goes way outside Japan. And some of this seems a little anachronistic, perhaps, to us now. Um, and it's hard because I'm sure the writer of the original novels you know, isn't as steeped in the history of the American West as we are. So how well that can be represented is um, there are going to be limitations there. I was actually pretty impressed at how reasonable it was. Um, it's obviously um, somewhat Hollywoodized, you know, a Hollywood view of history. Um, but I think like within that spectrum, I think it's reasonably well researched, um, despite being, again, pretty stereotypical. While I'm addressing my concerns with the film, it is also worth noting that the female characters generally do not fare well in this movie. Um, granted, a lot of the male characters don't fare well either, but uh, if you're a female character in this movie, you're probably not going to have a very good time. Um, you're probably going to suffer a lot of tragedy, and you are likely not going to make it out of the film. Um, and that is disappointing. Um, it is good to see um, a variety of female characters, some of whom are uh, you know have a lot of, of skill in combat and so forth, and some who who aren't. Um, but this is this definitely feels like a male power fantasy in a lot of ways. Um, and there was a point with that where I felt it was just kind of excessive. Um, so just be aware of that. So I hope you found this useful. Again, I don't want this to be a um, checklist of a bunch of different moments in the Dagger of Kamui. Um, I think it's much more beneficial for you to watch the movie and notice these things on your own um, now that I've kind of um, made you aware of them. And that way you get to experience that and you get to pull those things out and not only notice them, but categorize them yourself. And maybe you'll make your own video about the things you notice in the Dagger of Kamui. I hope so.